Salt has been a, considered a holy grail nutrient for reducing cardiovascular disease in populations over the last 40 years. And the central hypothesis for this approach is that uh, salt increases uh, blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure is a major risk factor for uh, having a heart attack or a stroke. So therefore, if we reduce salt intake in the population, we'll also reduce the amount of heart attacks and strokes as well. But is this supported by actual data or is it in large part conjecture? Well, that's the focus of my talk today. Now, firstly, uh, what are the current recommendations? Well, the WHO and the AHA uh, recommend that people consume anywhere between less than two to 2.4 grams of sodium per day or five to six grams of table salt per day, which is equivalent to approximately one teaspoon of table salt. And for high-risk individuals to consume even lower amounts, less than 1.5 grams per day of sodium or 3.8 grams of salt or 0.7 teaspoons of table salt per day. That's a very low amount of salt, very difficult for most people to sustain in the long term. Uh, and, uh, and so this would involve largely an overhaul of the food supply. Now, achieving these targets requires substantial change to the diet in most people. And so the current approach is a population-wide approach with public health policy and to get the entire population distribution of sodium shifted down toward the lower end from an average of 3.5 to 4 grams per day in Western populations, including the United States, down to an interim goal of 2.3 grams per day, and then eventually get it down to 1.5 grams per day, a, a major shift in the entire population. Now, is this 35 to 65% reduction in sodium in millions of people um, necessary, safe, and feasible? So the crux of the argument is that the blood pressure lowering effect of a reduction in sodium to low levels will reduce cardiovascular disease. Is this supported by the evidence? Well, first we'll look at the data on sodium and blood pressure, first starting off with the observational data. By far the most widely cited study is the InterSALT study published in 1988 in the British Medical Journal. And so this was a large uh, cross-sectional study. It was a global study in over 10,000 people in 52 centers worldwide. And what they found in InterSALT is that there's a rather a uh, modest relationship between sodium and blood pressure, about a one millimeter mercury increase in systolic pressure per gram increase in sodium, a rather modest relationship. Now, in the same issue of the British Medical Journal in which InterSalt was published, the Scottish Heart Study was published, an equally well-conducted study. And in that study, they found no relationship between sodium and blood pressure in free living in, uh, populations. But over the years, it's been the InterSALT study that has been widely quoted in the literature, while the Scottish Heart Study has been largely ignored. And then uh, recently, this is uh, data from uh, a uh, well-regarded study, the Framingham Offspring Study. Uh, this data presented at the Experim Experimental Biology Meeting last year. And what they found was that um, the people that were consuming lower amounts of sodium, shown in the blue line there, less than two and a half uh, grams per day had higher blood pressure than people with moderate or higher levels of sodium. So it goes in the opposite direction. Again, this is a free living population of generally healthy adults. So uh, you could see that generally in, a, in free living populations, the, the relationship between sodium and blood pressure is not as clear cut as we previously thought. And so that brings us to the data from randomized controlled trials. Now the DASH trial is the, uh, the landmark study in which the current recommendations are based on. Now DASH was published in 2001, New England Journal of Medicine. What they did in this trial is they compared um, different levels of sodium intake uh, in groups subdivided by uh, whether or not they were, on, uh, uh, they, they were on a control diet that was very low in potassium or a DASH diet that was high in potassium. So this is a factorial design randomized trial. It was a feeding study. And what they found was that among people with the, that were consuming the control diet, this was a very low potassium diet, lower than the, than the typical American diet, we see that sodium reduction results in a substantial reduction in blood pressure. But among people who got the DASH diet, which was high in potassium, we see that the effect of sodium on blood pressure is modest or, or even non-existent. It's, qu it's quite flat. 
uh, despite large reductions in sodium. Meaning it's not just a sodium story, it's also a potassium story. If we give people large amounts of potassium, we can mitigate or offset the effects of sodium on blood pressure. And this is also, remember, a largely uh, salt sensitive uh, group of people that they selected for the study. So the DASH trial has been the primary basis for the current AHA guidelines and the, and the US national dietary guidelines. Important to note that the DASH trial was a proof of concept study as to whether changes to multiple aspects of the diet, including sodium, under controlled situations will reduce blood pressure in that all of the food is provided to participants over a period of five weeks. So, and the, the outcome of course was blood pressure. This was not designed to assess if sodium reduction also reduces cardiovascular disease and mortality in free living populations. So, but nevertheless, the current recommendations are largely uh, based on DASH. And so in, uh, here's a meta-analysis of randomized trials in 2011, a Cochrane review published uh, by Grottle. Uh, 71 RCTs um, in normal intensive individuals. You could see in the forest plot, some trials showed a significant reduction in blood pressure. Uh, most of the trials showed no significant effect or neutrality, and a few showed an increase in blood pressure. DASH is one of these many different studies. Now, collectively, we see overall, when you pull across all of the data, you see only a 0.4 millimeter mercury inc uh, decrease in systolic pressure per gram reduction in sodium. Since so again, it's a very modest effect in normal tensive people. Larger in hypertensive people, but normal tensives, it's rather modest. Um, and so uh, in 2011, we uh, looked at data from on target. Uh, now this was, this was a secondary prevention study, people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease or diabetes. 28,000 people followed up over 56 months. Uh, morning fasting urines were collected at baseline, so we were able to measure sodium excretion versus um, cardiovascular outcomes. And you could see the, we had over 4,700 clinical events accrued during the follow-up. And you can see there's a sweet spot in the middle of, from about three to six grams per day associated with the lowest risk. At higher levels, above six grams per day, you start to see an increase in the risk for future clinical events. But at low levels, below three grams per day, you also see an increased risk. So being in the middle is optimal. If you were to consume what the current recommendation is, 1,500 milligrams for this population, you would be putting yourself at increased risk based on this data. And here's a meta-analysis in 2016 of cohort studies of sodium. You could see that consistency across studies, time and again, average sodium or moderate sodium does better than low sodium consistently across studies. So it's not just pure showing this. Pure sure is the largest study showing this, but it's not the only study. And this is recently in 2016 in JAMA in a paper by Mills. This is the Crick study sodium excretion and risk of cardiovascular events in people with uh, chronic kidney disease. Now in this study, they use multiple 24-hour urines. That's the most rigorous way to measure sodium. And you could see, I, now for the different outcomes, composite CBD, congestive heart failure, MI, and stroke, you see that um, I also drew with a, a red horizontal line the current recommendation, 2.3 grams per day. You could see that at high levels above about 4.5 grams per day, there's an increase in the risk for um, future cardiovascular events in this population. But you could see that the average level in Western populations is three and a half to four and a half grams per day. In the US is three and a half grams per day. Based on this data, lowering from three and a half to lower levels will not reduce cardiovascular events. You could see that clearly here, again using multiple 24 hour urines. And then they also presented their data by quartiles of sodium intake, where low, lowest level is the reference group. You could see that the second highest level of sodium intake, um, I mean the one level above the reference group, actually has a lower risk or trends for a lower risk. Uh, and so again, um, it still does not show that low sodium is better than average sodium intake compared to what the population consumes in Western society. So uh, our most recent paper published in uh, The Lancet in 2016, here we looked at sodium excretion versus uh, clinical events in people with and without hypertension. And this is at 133,000 people, data pool across four studies. Uh, overall, you see the figure on, at the uh, uh, top middle, there's a U-shape, uh, about three to six grams per day were associated with lowest risk. 
Similar to the results in, in the previous analyses, above six grams per day, we see an increased risk. Below three grams per day, we see an increased risk. Now, looking at hypertensives and non-hypertensives separately, at the low end, we see that low sodium is associated with increased risk regardless of blood pressure. So the, the, the potential harmful effect of sodium on events is independent of blood pressure at the low end. At the high end, we see that it's largely driven by blood pressure since we see an increased risk in hypertensives but not in, in, in normal tensives. So there's dual competing mechanisms. At very high levels of sodium, blood pressure becomes important. You get an increase in the risk of, of events. At the low levels, there's some other mechanism that's, that's playing a role that's increasing, possibly increasing risk. Um, we also plotted blood pressure, systolic and diastolic versus sodium. This is in the same 133,000 people. The red is hypertensives, blue is normal tensives. You could see the, the slope clear. With higher uh, sodium, we see higher blood pressure, uh, consistent with the intervention trial data. So again, the criticism of our method is largely uh, unfounded. You could see there's a clear relationship with blood pressure despite the uh, criticisms of, of some people. Now, why would low sodium be harmful? Well, there's data this is a, a paper published in 1972 in New England Journal by Pruner showing that at low levels of sodium intake, you see an exponential rise in renin and aldosterone, which we know is not a good thing. These are vascular damaging substances. And, uh, and you see it's, it's, again, an exponential increase. And this has largely been ignored, uh, even though it's pretty, pretty quite striking. And a uh, Cochrane review that compared low sodium to high sodium on cardiovascular biomarkers it, they found that uh, low sodium corresponded with higher renin and aldosterone levels, again consistent with the Bruner paper. Also higher epinephrine and norepinephrine and possibly higher levels of triglycerides as well with low sodium. But act activation of the renin angiotensin system appears quite clear with low levels of sodium intake. And that could explain the mechanism. And this should not be surprising. Salt is an essential nutrient. Sodium is an essential nutrient that the body needs. Every essential nutrient follows a U-shaped pattern. At high levels, you get toxicity. At low levels, you get deficiency. Why would it be any different for sodium? And we find this time and again for other essential nutrients as well. Now, uh, just a quick word on RCTs. There are currently no randomized controlled trials of low sodium versus average sodium versus clinical events. Uh, unfortunately, and, and RCTs are the standard for assessing the safety and eff efficacy of an intervention. So to conclude, sodium intake is related to blood pressure, but, but it's a modest relationship in people who uh, have uh, uh, normal blood pressure or people with cardiovascular or renal disease. Uh, sodium is associated with CVD in a J-shaped pattern. Uh, with high levels of intake, we see an increased risk only in hypertensives. With low levels of intake, we see an increased risk in both hypertensives and in normal tensives, suggesting an effect independent of blood pressure at lower levels. And uh, so there are concerns about too little sodium intake. So a targeted strategy where we focus on people who consume high levels of sodium and who have high blood pressure would be the optimal strategy rather than targeting the entire population at large, which may have unintended consequences. We can also target populations with very high levels like China and get, get them down to an average intake, what, like similar to what we see in Western populations. So as uh, IOM Committee Chair Brian Strom stated in, in 2013, it's not a question of studies showing benefit being better than those showing harm. There are no studies showing benefit.